All right, we are a few seconds in. I think we are still the only people here, but good morning or no good afternoon, technically. I am Sarah Marks. I am one of the librarians. I am the assistant director for communications and user experience, and I do the weekly live streams here on YouTube. Today, I am joined by the newest member of our research and learning team, Russell Perry. Welcome, Russell. For mostly um, the people who are going to watch on replay, why don't you give us, a, our students, an idea of the work that you're doing with us and what you're most excited about? Sure. Well, uh, thank you for that introduction, Sarah. I'm, as you said, I am Russell Perry. I'm the online services and reference coordinator here at the UMass Lowell Libraries. And my job going forward is going to be looking to see how we can make the most of connecting our users with all these fantastic resources we have, whether that's through um, online uh, live streams like this, uh, video tutorials, uh, bookable appointments to talk with myself or one of the other reference librarians, all that good stuff. So looking forward to doing all we can to bring these resources to you in the future. And this is a good moment to do the official plug the first official plug for the Ask a Librarian Services. Yes. Not only is this available throughout the week, every day, checking email, some live chat, but there is a collection of frequently asked questions that we're working to keep as up to date as we possibly can. And Russell is leading that effort. Uh, and one of the ways we're going to use it today is while the chat is available to you, some people without YouTube channels or Google accounts cannot necessarily ask their questions, and we want to hear your questions. So if you uh, are going to submit something maybe anonymously, we are paying attention to our Ask a Librarian intake. So if you email a question or the chat looks like it's live, feel free to submit your question that way. Russell is paying attention. Both he and I can see the YouTube chat. So we're going to answer your questions, but Today's topic is how we start our research with Credo. And the reason I wanted to do this is because Credo is one of our most underused tools. Uh, but it is an amazing one to get started with, especially when you don't know anything about the topic you're researching and you need some background information. I wanted to start the discussion with something else not just, oh, we have a person. I'm so excited. Somebody else showed up. Um, and that might just be Russell looking at the chat. <laughs> but I don't care. Um, I wanted to talk about Wikipedia in relation to Credo because Credo is a lot like Wikipedia. They're both what we call encyclopedias or reference books or within library circles, tertiary sources. And they have a very specific place in the research process. They're they're what we use to learn ourselves because you can't write a paper if you don't know what you're writing about, or you can't speak in a meeting or talk to your friends if you don't know something to start with. And a lot of us lean right into Wikipedia, and I am never going to criticize that because I love it too. I edit it. I do. I help other people learn how to edit it. But sometimes you need something with a little more authority behind it. And that's where these traditional encyclopedias are really helpful. But they do get out of date incredibly quickly because information moves much faster than publishing a book does. So we lean a lot into electronic sources, electronic encyclopedias, but Credo has some really fun bells and whistles that are helpful. Russell, what do you think about tertiary sources and references? Do you have any way that you think they're very useful? Uh, I do. I think they're great as a starting point when you're just beginning your research and you really are completely fresh to a topic. It's a good way to get a survey of what's out there and kind of the basic information to get you going. And some of these tertiary sources can point you in the right direction towards fantastic secondary or primary resources. But it's all comes to the idea that it's where you want to begin with your research, not where you want to end. That's a really good way of putting it. And one that I think a lot of people forget, especially people who are, who are going into research for the first time. You're not going to find the answer in one source. You're not going to find the perfect source. It's about layering things together. 
And when it comes to writing papers, your professors will tell you they want peer reviewed. But if you're still trying to learn the basics, our databases, especially Credo, do take you beyond the resources that are in that collection to the next one, just like Wikipedia does with that long list of citations at the end of an entry. But instead of you waiting for someone to discover the right article, the way Wikipedia is crowdsourcing the development happens, somebody is paid to do the work at Credo. So how do you get to Credo? That's really simple. You start from our library webpage, uml.edu slash library. We're always here. I would click on databases first. My number one suggestion, don't Google Credo reference and expect to get to it because we've got this all coded so that only our students have access to this. You've paid for it, so we want you to have exclusive access. You can click C, you can go to database type. There's a whole section about encyclopedias and dictionaries, uh, but I'm a C, I'm an alphabetical fan. You can also search the databases for Credo. You'll get to see all of our databases that start with C. Uh, we are gonna briefly mention CQ Researcher at the end, but keep in mind that that is there as well. Now, I am off campus. You'll notice it doesn't ask me to log in, and that's because I've already logged into my email. Russell, you're on campus. Do you ever, uh, when you're at home, do you get requests to log in frequently? Or uh, I do. It depends on whether I've already logged into other UML services. Usually, if I have, then it carries over those credentials, but sometimes I'm asked again. Yeah. Uh, so there's three things that I think are amazing about Credo. One is you can search. Just like every search engine, you can type in your terms. It's showing you how many full text articles it has. Everything here is full text. Um, and they have 121 publishers contributing to this. So this is a large collection of reference sources. Uh, my second favorite is these topic pages because Sometimes you don't know the terminology you're going to be searching for, and you'll get a lot of nonsense that doesn't really fit, but mentions a word. But if you're going to do research about drone aircraft, which I'm fascinated that it falls into humanities for them, um, I would have much preferred it in something a little more engineering based. But, um, but if you click on drone aircraft, it's going to take you to a page that they've built that'll give you um, my third favorite feature of Credo, this mind map right here, that is an interactive mind map. So if I click any of these, it will take me to them, uh, to entries about them. But if I break it out, I can usually realign the, no, it's not letting, yeah, I can realign the mind map around that new terminology and look at it from a different point of view with other terms, other ideas combining together, uh, which is something you can do if you go to, it used to be like right here in the, um, nope. They used to have it really easy to find and now I can't find it anywhere. Um, but they also do these research quick tip videos to help you get started and understand what you're doing. Uh, so it has all these features available to you. Uh, Russell, do you have anything you like to use Credo to do? Well, uh, like you pointed out, Sarah, the mind map is great, um, especially when you start getting into authorized subject terms, which is a fancy way of saying that a lot of times when you're doing research, experts in the field will agree on a specific way to phrase topics on a given subject. And it might be exactly what you think it is. It might be something totally different. So these mind maps are a great way to see how other people are referring to the same topic or related topics in a way that you might not have considered before. Yeah. Uh, meteorology is a good one, too, because meteorology is all of atmospheric sciences. But you might not want to talk about that. You might want to talk more about the climate or maybe radar if you're going into um, into weather research, uh, tropical cyclone, and I only know this because this is my father's career, 
that's a hurricane, but that's not how they're talking about it because hurricane is a term we primarily use in the US. So if you're looking at research across the, the world, not just US, knowing how they talk about it is critical because you would have not gotten to Hurricane Katrina if you didn't know the tropical cyclone was the same as hurricane. Um, so that's always interesting to know about is that this is here and available for you. Uh, and you can see that, um, well, she BT, this is fascinating. Uh, <laughs> so I'm looking down here at the recent mind maps that I was doing, rainbow flag, LGBT, on manned aerial vehicle is the is the thread, um, and if you don't know how this works, it's it's broad the rainbow flag LGBT and then unmanned uh, aerial vehicle. This is my search history of using um, using Credo's mind maps. This is my path. It's not the the path that this is not nested one to the other. This is my path of research, so I can go back and get the rainbow flag entry. Um, and see all of the content about rainbow flags. And if you don't know, the, uh, the reason I did this search recently was because we have a display at Leiden Library about the LGBTQ plus flags and some beautiful books about them. So you can see your history. This wasn't today. This was like weeks ago that I did this. So Credo remembers what you're doing and what you've done so you can get back to it across sessions. Uh, yes, they are tracking you. Uh, and they do have a search history and advanced search feature so that you can actually go back to all your searches, not just the, the, clink, the links you've clicked over time. Uh, so let's do, let's look at the rainbow flag since we're here. Um, this is uh, the articles. They're showing us the results. There's 21 all types. It's giving us a couple things. Reference means they're likely encyclopedias, definitions, dictionaries, pro-con. This is a feature that a lot of first year students like, especially those in writing classes who are learning how to craft an argument. Uh, they give you two sides so that you get multiple perspectives and can frame your research around what you're learning from those. Subjects, social science, history, date ranges. Nothing here goes back farther than 2013. So it is relatively recent. And you can look at the length. Some of these, most of these are long, but there are a couple short and medium length articles. What does long mean? Well, you can see how many words in your search results. Uh, so here's one encyclopedia entry, the Sage Encyclopedia of Trans Studies. It has 983 words and one image. This is the encyclopedia article. It gives us some suggested readings from within Credo. It gives you further readings. One is a YouTube video. But you can see link source will try to find the article for you in our collection or connect you to interlibrary loan, which we'll get to. And if you have a question about interlibrary loan, by all means, please put it in the chat so we make sure we get to it. And then here are two names, Jenny and Monica. They're the people who worked on this article, who wrote it, who collected the resources, did the research. And... Here's your citation if you use this in your paper. Uh, APA, Chicago, Harvard, MLA, the four big ones. And you can see what the book is. This is what it looks like. We have access to it. And then you can, and this is something that a lot of people forget. But when you're looking at a bookshelf in a traditional library or bookstore, you're seeing everything around a book. And it's sort of this fun serendipity in libraries because you discover other books about the same subject. And when you were looking at a traditional print encyclopedia, you were flipping through the pages and seeing the other articles around it. These features allow you to do something like that. So I can click next article or previous article 
and get to the next thing in it. And this is what it has here. And it continues forward or backwards as you want. Uh, save, cite, print, share, read aloud. It does for those with visual impairments have a feature where you can have someone read this. Have a, it, I think it is an AI voice. Read this for you. And if you're more comfortable reading in another language, it has a variety that you can get to and get this translated into. And this is also part of the AI systems available to it. And then over here, search other sites, the library catalog, academic search premier, CQ researcher. Uh, this is a collection of our resources like JSTOR. Eric is for education. There's a bunch here that you can start with. I suggest the library catalog and academic search premier. Uh, this will take you directly into that collection and search the term for you. So here we have, it's already populated trans studies and come back with 79 results. So this is that cookie crumb trail that Russell mentioned of taking you from the beginning to uh, expanded collections of resources. So was there anything you noted that you might wanna have highlighted while we're well, just here? sort of uh, building off of that, I think it's great that Credo builds those shortcuts in. So rather than having to open up a separate tab or a separate browser window entirely and look for these things, you can go right from the page you're searching to any of our other resources, like the catalog, like these other databases, and kind of kickstart your research just from that point. Yeah, I think that a lot of the frustration is for me is having to go back to the library webpage, remember the database I was going to click on, search that with terms, and then navigating through all of those results. It's a lot to click on. And the fewer things we have to click on, the happier we are. It saves time. Yeah, it's a great way to streamline the process for sure. Mm -hmm. Do you have an example search that maybe we can do to show people what happens when you search a topic instead of clicking on one of the, one of the topic pages like we did? Okay, sure. Well, uh, why don't we uh, try something like um, uh, climate change, let's say, if we uh, put that in here. So we could have clicked on the topic, but now I'm taping it into the search. So it gives us something a little different. Uh, it's this is the most anticipate, anticipatory work that this database does. It looks at the terms we're typing in and starts suggesting content for us. But it's not going to force it on us like Google, which will say, I searched this instead of what you typed in. Mm -hmm. uh, because Google thinks it knows what we want, and that's its job. These aren't about you being in control. So it's going to suggest, and you can click on any of them, but you're making the decision, not the search engine. So when we search climate change, it brings back what it thinks, what it's being asked to give us. So we have our mind map again. We have our 11,263 results. We can see key concepts related. Uh, and then over here on the right are more library resources. And these are from slightly different collections. These are mostly from our Gale resources, uh, which might change as we change our collection and get more things available to you and within Credo. Uh, so you can see that it's trying to connect you to those articles again. So you could click on, uh, let's say, Gale in Context Science, you can see all those results. And instead of Academic Search Premier, it takes you into our Gale collection where there's a lot of, what I like about the Gale collections, and we'll probably get into this in a little bit, is um, that there are a lot of images and videos here and audio that you don't get in a lot of the more academic databases. This is sort of those, one of those in-between databases because these go to every library in the state of Massachusetts. They have a lot more of the popular content balanced into the academic content. So you'll see news, biographies, websites, audio, reference, statistics, video, experiments, and academic journals. 
But I'm going to click on the next one, global warming, because it is still looking for these keywords to come back in the results, not necessarily what things are about. We can see the related searches, narrower and broader, uh, and um, you're seeing the source again. So it's giving you more suggestions to, to provide you with that serendipity opportunity. So this is how you can get started with Credo. And we have no questions. It's still just us. Anything else you would like to share about Credo that I have overlooked? Well, just to point out some of these, uh, a little more particularly about some of these tools. Um, when you were looking before at the uh, broader list, and you could see all these suggestions from the different Gale pages, it's another way to get you thinking about some of these different topics. Um, mm -hmm. We mentioned before about the shortcuts to our different databases and the catalog using your exact terms that you already used while searching Credo. But it's another way to consider some of these topics with these suggestions that are coming up from Gale in its various forms. Yes, that's a good point. Um, because if you're learning about something for the first time, you are not going to know all the ways to talk about it. You're just, we're not. That's why we're learning about it. Even somebody with a lot of knowledge uh, might not see the interconnectivity of ideas. Uh, one of one of my um, favorite things is, um, and now I can't remember the search offhand, but it was oh, it was depression. Okay, when you think about depression, you think about psychological depression, brain chemistry depression, but then we forget. We have a great depression in this country in the 20th century that is a depression. We have economic depressions, historical and future and possibly current. We have geographical, geological depressions in the earth that we can study. So when we say depression, we need to be so much more specific then we realize we have to be because we have four basic general subjects that that can fall under. And yes, psychological depression is going to be the default because of how we talk about it. But here's the mind map, the, and I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Katara depression is a geographical depression think it's a geographical depression. Yeah, it's, you can see it's with Atlas and Weather Guide, geographical names. This is something that's coming up. And maybe if this was what you had wanted in the first place, you would have lost most of that in the sea of resources about depression. But maybe you didn't know you had to say it with the specific name of the geographical depression. So that's one of my favorite uh, examples of how diverse our language is for one word. English could mean so many different things. My favorite uh, TikTok and Instagram uh, real videos are those who are, um, when people talk about the, the way one word is used, the word there could mean three different things. And you could have there, there, there in a complete sentence, all three versions of it in some capacity. So it's worth thinking about when you're doing your research. You might think of the term, but think more specific as much as you are going to think broader so that you understand the subject you're gonna fit into so that you don't get the wrong results or get frustrated because you're gonna get frustrated. All right, so what is there beyond Credo? because this is not the only collection of primary uh, and ter or tertiary sources that we have. I mentioned earlier, we have this one CQ Researcher. This is Congressional Quarterly Researcher. It's something that used to be done by uh, Have you ever used CQ Researcher, Russell? Only a little bit um, so far. It really depends on the type of research you're doing. And uh, this is especially useful if you're looking for uh, issue-focused research. Um, 
especially if you're doing some kind of exercise like a debate, looking at two sides of an issue. This is a great place to start for that. This is, and this is a lot of what our writing college writing students like and our college writing professors like because it gives you that pro-con perspective. Uh, it does have a few things over here. So um, that gives you your featured report. This is usually its most currently updated one. In this case, global vaccine inequity. Uh, this goes beyond COVID and the flu shots. This goes into things like malaria vaccinations, I'm sure. Uh, but they'll give you this overview. They have discussion questions so that you can either use that as your research topic or if you're doing something like a debate, bring that up uh, for discussion. Chronology, something that a lot of people struggle with is timeline, making sure you have the right date. Uh, and then you have your pro cons and they lean into policy leaders people who are uh, in charge of uh, non-government organizations because they're trying to get experts not just people who have done some research and are writing a comprehensive uh, response uh, so you see we have a policy co-leader for the people's vaccine alliance she's our pro pov and our con is the director general for the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations. So probably a lobbyist. Uh, and she, I'm sure she has a lobbyist too. Uh, and then you have other things. This is the outline so that you can see all the information. Uh, so when we click to see the full report, you can see all of that information here. Also download your PDF. Cite your source. This is one thing I wish Wikipedia did, but will never do because it's a lot of work, even to code it uh, with, a, with a bot. Um, this gives you how to cite this article in your paper. Uh, so here is your issue tracker. It too has related content. This is a very long, it has a lot of great images, a lot of great tables. And let's take it to the very end. All their sources, you can see that they are links when they have links available. And then at the very end, who our author is, the document APA citation is at the very end, and the web address if you're crafting the citation for the file that it's not providing. So there is a lot here, and this is, huge as our, as far as articles go, because they don't just rewrite the whole thing. They start adding on content and you can see how old something is. Um, one thing that these do is that these go back to the 1990s. I mean, these are older than most of our students. So for, for currency, which is something we tend to assume with Wikipedia because of how it's created, uh, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, we'll have plenty of topics. Uh, let's say transportation is going to have a bunch that are older. Air safe and things that you think would be updated relatively recently are not. So we have uh, privatizing government services is from 2017. Airline safety, 2015. Domestic drone, a very current topic, hasn't been updated since 2013. So you do have to be careful because if it hasn't been updated, anything that's going on currently is not going to be included. Russell, have you noticed anything in CQ Researcher that we should make students aware of? Well, just sort of uh, jumping off that point, Sarah, if you do find that there is um, a post that hasn't been updated in a long while, it could still be useful as far as a snapshot of the discussion at that point in time, as long as you frame it that way. Um, but yeah, it's it's an important thing to keep an eye out for how an issue has changed over time, how frequently it's updated or not, and all of that you can uh, see in that little uh, section we were just looking at before. Very convenient, very easy to uh, track it with links to those different postings over time. Yeah. Uh, if you're Professor gives you an assignment where you have to think of a current event or a current topic of something for your paper. These are also great places to go to get them. This one is outlining its hot topics. 
And when a topic is really current, really getting a lot of discussion, they do go in and they make sure it's updated. So they did climate change in August, death penalty in September. They just did healthcare policy a month ago. Oh my God, it's already the middle of March. Immigration crisis in December. So you can see these are what people are talking about. I mean, marijuana legislation is a staple of freshman writing class papers and debate and speech classes that um, is always interesting to hear a different take on it. But you do have a different take these days as it is increasingly legalized. We can no longer argue in Massachusetts that it should be because it is. Uh, so that paper topic's out, but there's so much more to talk about within that. If this is the topic you're passionate about, let's get some interesting perspectives and using these sources might help you do that. All right, anything else we wanna see in, oh, oh and that, Here's something, upcoming reports. So you can see what they are working on now. Uh, Forever Chemicals, this is new to me. Aging and Mental Health is coming at the end of the month. So you can see what's on their schedule for 2023. And you can suggest topics so that you can, um, you can see if they might, re they might update something that you're looking to get information about. But this is when they publish updates. The so CQ researchers, something to consider. I'm going to go back into this Gale database. Uh, while you can get to the next one from our A to Z list, uh, when you're in a Gale database, if you go to library menu and you go to view Gale product menu, they have a lot of these in context databases, which is their way of uh, positioning these comparative collections, these pro-con, different point of view collections. The two I like, one is more U.S. centric and the other is global centric. They are global issues and opposing viewpoints. So global issues, and they're very similar in structure and content, but with a broader point of view for global issues. Um, so this is global issues. They do like CQ research, that pro-con point of view, that overview topical page. Sometimes they're a little more current. What they do that CQ research doesn't do is biography content because Gail has a biography and context database. So if we want to look at Malala and get information about her for Women's History Month, here's some content about her and women's rights. And you can see that they've got this organized by what the content is. So if you want to get those academic journals versus the viewpoints versus the primary sources, the strength of these in-context uh, collections are these viewpoints. This one has 962 viewpoints. This is not necessarily a pro-con point of view, but a broader sense of the perspective, taking on niche points of view versus broader ones. So a sustainable feminist recovery versus Trudeau in Canada believes in women's rights to choose, he should legislate it. Versus India, bring on the marriage strike. Because this has a global point of view, there's not just two, there's a lot to talk about. So you can see all their viewpoints. And some of these are going to be from newspaper sources, but others are going to be written uh, sometimes for global issues and context. Uh, this is a one from a Manila Bulletin. It's a guest commentary. They tell you the content level. I'm never quite sure what it means for content level. My assumption is always the higher the level, the more complex the the ideas, and they're for higher level. Uh, students, but it gives you the sense of what the commentary is and then gives you the article itself for you to look through. And again, there is site send, download, print, get link. You can make highlights. That's a fun feature with this collection. And then it's going to branch you out to more like the other ones do so that you can continue your search without having to bounce from database to database. All right, let's go back to our results. Sure. 
trying to get back to the main page. There we go. Uh, so you can see it does give you these topics of in issues of interest, but then it does break it down by subject. Uh, and it has 684 issues. Now, a US focused one is not going to talk about blood diamonds or uh, for sterilization the same way we're going to talk about it from a global scale because of so many different perspectives of the world, religious, social, economic, uh, geographic, and all changes our perspective on issues. Russell, do you have uh, anything interesting that you like from Global Issues? Have you played with it frequently? Uh, I played around a little bit with it. And uh, like you say, it's interesting to see not only the kind of broadening of the approach to it by looking at it from all these different resources around the world, but keeping that in mind, then seeing, all right, if you're looking at it from a global perspective, how is it related to all these other categories like business, like health and medicine, like politics and so forth. So it's all these different cross sections of looking at something. And again, depending on what your research assignment or interest might be, a global perspective might be more in keeping with what you're wanting to explore, or it might you might be wanting to focus on a, a more US-based thing. It really depends on what your individual research interests are at this time. Yeah. And I think for freshmen who are presented with ever, uh, with freedom to pick what you write about and not having maybe had that freedom in high school or really the experience of knowing how to finesse a topic so that it's manageable within five pages of writing, these are really great places to just see what piques your interest. And maybe this is just me and my librarian mindset because librarians have this knack for being super curious. But I know about blood diamonds. I know the basics. But seeing it here on this list makes me want to click it and learn everything I can possibly learn uh, from global issues and contacts. And if you're the person who's like that, who sees something come up in your life, in your world, on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube, and you're like, I've got to just deep dive into that. And I know a lot of people especially those uh, on the different spectrum of uh, engagement, really can get into that. If you're like the little detective in your life, this is the place to be a little detective because now we can do a deep dive into blood diamonds uh, in a way that Wikipedia might take you down this rabbit hole, but will it take you down it the same way and give you so much to look at at one time? And I don't think it does. And I love Wikipedia. Uh, the browse map is a little different than most people are used to because this is global. You can start looking at specific countries. If you are one of our international students and you want to write about something in your home country that we might not know about or your professor would like you to, to write more about, here are those countries. You can click on any one of them let's say Sudan, and see what those issues are that they have in here. The conflict in Darfur, the Sudan, we have Yemen over here, totally different topics. We have Myanmar. We have um, things that like the Burmese Myanmar uprisings. Like, do you know anything about that? Will this help you? We have an amazing Cambodian community in Lowell, but not all of us know much about what's going on in Cambodia or why. And here's an opportunity to get sources. And in this case, it is a country overview. If you need details about population, language, area, currency, literacy rates, this is all here for you in global issues so that you can get that fundamental primary, what from a source that is reputable, but isn't going to be your primary source for your paper. And then you can get to those better sources, those what we call secondary, but they're the academic journals, the, um, the books, the newspaper and magazine articles. This is all here, including statistics, which are what we call primary sources, especially in the social sciences uh, and some of the uh, humanities. Having statistics is a nice way to give people the raw number without somebody else's interpretation on it. 
The other one I wanted to show is opposing viewpoints. And this will be the last thing I think we're going to be able to get to today. But this is the U.S. focused version of what global issues is. So everything in here has the lens of the U.S., the anti-science, youth sports, immigration. These are the, the ones of interest right now. But you can see there's a lot different content here. The EPA comes up here because this is a U.S. specific agency. Uh, U.S. NATO relations, instead of the general NATO conversations, it's going to focus on what's going on with us in relation to that. Uh, you can see what's updated. Title IX, very hot topic, as is youth sports, guns and violence, K-12 education, weapons of mass destruction, something we've been hearing about for over 20 years and still remains hot, uh, PTSD. All of these are here. And like Global Issues in Context, it shows you uh, the content. It gives you this overview. And then it features the viewpoints first and foremost. So there are 13 viewpoints here on renewable energy. Again, it's not necessarily a pro versus con because this is a very broad topic. There's a lot of different perspectives on it. <clears throat> and you can see here's our something about phasing out fossil fuels and what we would have to do to, to do that. This is from the Washington Post. So it gives you that article commentary again. So it sort of sums up what this perspective is, who this person is. They're a professor out of Harvard. And then they give you questions to consider. This is to help you process through this. So there's a lot on these databases to help you get started. And then of course, citations. We never forget citations on our resources. We will always try to make this as easy for you as we possibly can, recognizing it's never gonna be easy. So this is my reminder with citations, always check to make sure things are capitalized correctly because MLA, we capitalize some things, APA, we capitalize other things, and they're not the same, and they might need to be fixed. But they do a really good job of getting you the basics and having it ordered and formatted with the, with the parentheses and the commas and the periods and the colons. They do that pretty well. And those are the little things that make citations obnoxious and unbearable for our undergraduate students and our graduate students and our faculty, and sometimes our librarians. Russell, is there anything you think we should share while we're here about opposing viewpoints, a rant about citations? <laughs> well, that's the uh, <clears throat> that's the evergreen topic, isn't it? Um, yeah, just um, like Sarah was saying, even if it's not exactly correct, these things are a great uh, resource as far as the citation uh, hub here to give you the basic information you need. And if you do find yourself needing to adapt, it's usually minor things rather than the crucial elements of author, title, different things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could just scroll back to the uh, top of this uh, article, sir, I just wanted to point out one thing that is uh, another useful element with uh, Gail here. Besides the um, kind of overview of the article before you get into the body of it itself, if you look on the right, you see more like this, where it's suggesting similar pieces on this topic. And you can see it ranges from uh, the New York Times to Global Warming Focus, but they're on a similar topic. They're still within a relatively recent time frame, and it just pulls a few. But if you click on the button View All Related Articles, then you can explore all these other um, related materials that, again, if you're just looking at it real quick, you might miss on a first pass. Yeah. That's a really good feature to point out to them because that's really the struggle. Uh, it's been a long time since I've sat at a reference desk, but I think you are spending a lot of time interacting with students and realizing that a good chunk of the frustration people have is finding enough that we're overwhelmed when we search. We get so much back in those results, but we don't know how relevant they are we assume they're relevant because those are the terms we search, but they're not always. 
as relevant as we think they should be. They're just pulling back the terms we've put in. They're somewhere in that article and the search engine thinks it's relevant. But there's a person on the other side of opposing viewpoints, global issues, CQ researcher, and credo. Someone is making some decisions at some point to sort of collect these things. And you mentioned uh, the the search terms, these approved topics that we we as librarians, this is part of what we do is we look at things and we see how they connect. And I like to talk about things as buckets, like this is the bucket of everything that is about climate change. And it's gonna overlap a little with something like tornadoes or uh, global warming, but there's a whole bucket about tornadoes that's got its own focus and its own content. And people don't realize that this is not what Google's doing. Google's just pulling back those terms. Even a basic search is just pulling back those terms. When somebody puts their fingers in the mix and starts moving things around and organizing it, then you're getting closer to what things are about rather than what they mention. And this feature, more like this, is the output of that work. So there is nobody at Google who is picking your search results for you. There's nobody at EBSCO picking your search results out for you when you use article quick search. But in these cases, there is someone who's saying, okay, you've gotten here. Now let me open this up for you, taking you to all the other things you could possibly use about this topic. So it is an interesting way to start your research. And one thing I appreciate about these databases that is a struggle with Wikipedia, and I see this because I'm on the editing side, a lot of editors on Wikipedia struggle to know if a source is appropriate to add in. And then you have the added bonus of people trying to promote themselves by adding in their personal content. And there's a lot of rules in Wikipedia about what can be used as a source on an entry and what can't be used. But it takes a lot of time for someone to necessarily discover that something inappropriate has been used and it might get missed. There's not a lot of oversight. There's a lot of trust, but not a lot of control. So you might get inappropriate results, something that's heavily biased because it just hasn't been noticed yet. And in here, when you get those biased perspectives and not to criticize the perspective, just to recognize that it's one side versus another, they're acknowledging it. They're giving you this as the, th that is the point of this. You are getting this perspective, but here's another one to balance that out. So they're being very upfront because they want you to get a subjective point of view, but also get the content you need to craft the argument you're going to make. So these are things to keep in mind when you're deciding where to start your research on a new topic to you. We have 10 minutes, Russell. What should we talk about for these last few minutes? I'm inclined to just talk about Ask a Librarian for 10 minutes, but uh, since we don't really have any questions, it's very quiet and we'll keep an eye on the replay comments. So if you have a question afterwards, please leave them in the YouTube comments, but even better, go to Ask a Librarian and ask for help and reference that you saw this live stream and need some more information. Um, but anything you want people to know about that we didn't get to talk about yet? Um, well, I think it might be handy to show off some of the kind of starting tools for research besides um, Credo and Global Perspective and whatnot. Um, maybe if we could go to the uh, LibGuide hub just to yeah. point that out for people. So, um, yeah, if you go to the uh, library homepage, left menu, click on LibGuides, you'll see all these guides here that have been curated by the library staff to collect the best resources on all these different topics for you. So let's say if you go to uh, criminal justice, maybe uh, towards the top of the page there, you expand that bar, you can see we've got these different research guides. So the top one is gonna give you a general overview of our resources in the subject of criminal justice. So you can see there's an overview of searching Google versus searching the library. And then on the sidebar, there's a couple of menus for topic specific research. Uh, so like finding articles, for instance, um, or exploring a topic, all these different ways to kind of point you towards 
the best resources on this particular subject. And we have guides like this for pretty much any topic you can imagine for the major disciplines that we provide here at UMass Lowell. This is a great feature that uh, I often forget to talk about because what I like about these subject guides is um, your professor is going to say things like find books, find articles. We're talking about finding topics and learning more about topics, but things like government, advocacy, evidence-based research. These are upper level research resources that tend to be used by, um, by upperclassmen, juniors and seniors and graduate students because they're, they're just, they're not better, they're not worse, they're just different uh, because especially in criminal justice, advocacy, evidence-based, these are things that are, are trying to take what's being done to the next level. So knowing how to find those tools is something that other subjects don't need to know the same way. So having this guide is a really good place to learn about the other types of sources your field might need. And yes, criminal justice has a wealth of statistics available because our federal government, and I'm going to say this, regardless of your political perspective, our government collects statistics amazingly well. It is, there is just so much statistics from the government because this is this is the way a bureaucracy works. It collects data and you can use that data because it is free. That is something that uh, increasing number of fields, if you get federal funding for research as a professor or a academic or in the field, you have to make your research publicly available, which means the students get to use it for their own papers. So you can get people's interpretations of data in articles, or you can get the data itself and figure out how it all connects together on your own, if that is a passion for you. I also don't wanna forget interlibrary loan only because we always get asked about it and it's always something people need to know about. We will get you everything you need for free. We do not keep you away from content just because we don't have it. But you do need to create an account the very first time, and this is a good time of year to remind people that this happens. So sometimes you'll be, here we go, back to our full text finder. You can request this thing through interlibrary loan. It will take you to, it will do something someday. I think it's just going to go in circles. There we go. Uh, sure. It'll take you to Iliad. The first time you're here, if you've never used this before, create an account. If you've already created an account but can't remember, go to forget password or forgot password because it gets weird if you've forgotten and create a second account. It's it's not the smartest system at all. Uh, but here's mine. You log in. Once you've created your account, it wants a new password. Uh, I'll deal with that later. But here you can submit your request. But if you're coming from this full text finder, it's going to populate that form for you. And the service is pretty quick. It can take... This time of year, I anticipate waiting about 48 hours, just two days for them to get, because this is because a lot of people start requesting things. So don't freak out until two days have passed. And you'll be able to go in here and see outstanding requests, electronically received articles. All your articles will be right here for you to print your books or your DVDs or CDs. If you dare to request one of those and watch it uh, or listen to it, those will be something you physically pick up at a library. So when you sign up for the first time, remember which library you've said you're going to pick up at should you have a physical item. Leiden for, is for those of you who are on North Campus most of the time. O'Leary is the right one for those of you who are on South Campus most of the time. I know it doesn't say North and South, and sometimes that's how we talk about it. That's why I want to make sure you know, because the worst, the most annoying thing is to go pick up your library book and realize it's at the other library. Um, and then you have to go across campus to get to it, especially if we're going to have a snowstorm this week, which there's a, there's a rumor we are. 
Uh, but when you're on the library webpage, if you go to services overview and you go to interlibrary loan, there will be the links here for logging in. And any questions that you have about interlibrary loan are probably here for you. Uh, and they are also in Ask a Librarian. So final push for Ask a Librarian. We're actually going to go see it. You can see the email addresses, the phone numbers, our staff directory, our, our featured FAQs, but also the most popular ones, new ones that we've, I think, updated. It does this by the last updated. But you can search to see if your question's already been asked and answered. It saves you a lot of time. You can submit it via email. You can get into LibChat, but if you Always see this questions, ask us, red flag. That is probably Russell on the other side. You can submit your question and start a chat right from all of our web pages. You don't have to download anything or include anything specific. You can make it anonymous. Well, you have to put in a name, but you can make it anonymous. Uh, but type in your question and the librarian who's on will chat with you. And then of course, we have our service hours uh, from about 12.30 to 4, I believe, 3.30 or 4, in Monday through Thursday. Uh, Russell can correct me if I'm It's 12.30 uh, to 4.30. 12.30 to 4.30. And then people jump on live chat in the afternoon for our, uh, especially great for our online only students who never come to campus but still need research help because you have papers to write just as much as our on-campus students, and we're here to support you for that as well. The last thing to know, we are doing this again next Monday, same time. The link will be posted on our YouTube channel, so subscribe uh, to be on that live stream. And we're talking about JSTOR and ArtStore for research articles, historical research articles, because the beauty of JSTOR is that you get every issue and every article in a journal all the way back to its very first article and issue. So I'm gonna show you how to make that something you go to primarily for research, especially in the humanities and social sciences. Thank you, Russell, for joining me. You have two minutes. Is there any last pitch you wanna make for something that we haven't talked about yet? Um, all I would say is just to uh, reiterate, um, feel free to reach out to any of us on the reference staff. That's what we're here for. We want to help you find what you need. So please visit Ask a Librarian if you have any questions about this or any other research topics you might have. Thank you. And thank you for everyone, primarily those of you who are watching. And it looks like somebody joined us at the very end of the live stream. If you have a question, quick, 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 we have two minutes. You can type it in. We'll repeat anything we have already said. Uh, but if you uh, have any other questions or have other topics you think we should cover, you can leave them in the comments of the video on replay or right now and we will add that to the list. We're doing these every Monday for the rest of the semester from 11, from noon to 1 p.m. so that you can have uh, a little help on your lunch breaks. Uh, hopefully you will also have been able to eat lunch during this hour, which is what I'm gonna go do next. And Russell, I hope you enjoy your lunch break and thank you for joining me. Thanks and for having I, me. I will see everybody on campus. Take care, everybody.